So anyway, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of Old Dominion University, thank you so much for, well, um, I wanted to welcome you to Reyes, which is the remote experience for young engineers and scientists. My name is Armando Ayala. You might have seen me before in moderating other talks and also giving some talks in this awesome project. I'm an associate professor in the engineering technology department at Old Dominion. And today I'll be serving as your moderator for the engineering session titled um, Design Thinking Agile Innovation Project. This is a hands-on workshop on an expanded design thinking process focused on agile, on agile project management foundation to innovation and, and entrepreneurship. Now, today's speaker is a very good friend of mine. His name is Rafael Landaeta, Dr. Landaeta. He's originally from Venezuela, like me. That might be the reason we have a very good connection, very good relationship. He's an associate professor in the Department of Engineering Management and System Engineering. But more importantly, he's also the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education in our college. He holds a PhD in Industrial Engineering, a Master of Science in Engineering Management from University of Florida, Central Florida. His research focuses on continuous improvement, improvement of knowledge-intensive project-based organizations, including agility, innovation, entrepreneurship. Now, we're gonna start the presentation. Um, there'll be a few hands-on activities where you'll be asked to work on for a few minutes on your own. And let's remember that it, there is a 35 minutes delay, so let's be conscious about that. Um, feel free to ask any questions, start sending the questions through the chat, and Professor Landeta will answer as many questions as possible during the presentation and also at the end. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna leave it to you, my dear friend, Professor Rafael Landeta. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here with you all today. Uh, I just want to uh, clarify that there is a 35 seconds uh, delay and, uh, uh, and, uh, and that we are going to be uh, responding to your questions as, as I can. So as, as Professor Ayala said, uh, there are a few uh, areas during uh, this uh, workshop in which I expect you to do something. So I please go and grab pen and pencil and, uh, and clear your, your mind so that you'll be with me for about an hour and a half. Uh, we'll see how it goes. And after that, I'll uh, stop and get um, to answer questions uh, until we are done with, with time. Um, I hope that you are coming to this presentation because you want to know more about it, uh, of what design thinking and agile innovation projects may entail. If you practice, you may learn a few things new. If you've never done it, I'm going to provide you with the basics and with some additional techniques. And uh, 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 But uh, I just wanted to say that, that this is a topic that I have been very passionate about for quite a while. And uh, I used to do uh, research and, uh, and teaching in, in what is called traditional project management and traditional project management started in the uh, 60s when the Department of Defense was trying to put control upon how projects were actually being managed. And they, they established certain type of, of, of work structure that worked for that time and not necessarily works for us today. And, uh, uh, and that's where the agile movement came in, trying to understand that you never can predict nowadays the future, and therefore you cannot put a plan into a project that you don't know uh, what is actually uh, uh, going to produce. So, uh, but but again, we got caught into these tools and techniques that we use it in the wrong way, and then projects start getting delayed. And all that is with respect to the, the agile movement, and with respect to the design thinking movement. Uh, and this group from, from California, a professor from Stanford, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, two professors from Stanford put together this company and, and out of the, the design uh, uh, school. And, and, and they wrote several books and have now this company called IDEO that practice uh, design thinking uh, and make, make a business out of it. So, uh, uh, there is a lot of commonalities between the design thinking process and the engineering process. 
and, uh, and they intersect uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, however, the design thinking uh, concept uh, adds uh, a few um, uh, elements into what the engineering uh, process uh, actually have. So, and vice versa. And, and uh, so that, that's part of pretty much a good introduction of, of what we're going to be talking today. And then how we can have a project that focus on uh, innovating in, in finding and in using design thinking to actually bring uh, a potential solution to a problem to life. And uh, uh, with, uh, without further ado, let's start going into uh, the presentation. And also it's important for me to tell you that I will make this presentation available. So um, don't uh, overstress in, uh, in copying what it is in, in every slide. As, as, I, as I said, it's gonna be uh, available. Another important thing is take notes, um, write questions as we go so that in the end you, you can um, ask me if during a, uh, an exercise you do have a question, I will answer those questions in, immediately. But if the question is about a, a, a concept or a, or a general thought, I, I would like to answer those in the end, okay? So let me repeat that again. So I answer questions on the exercise at the right moment of the exercise and questions about anything else, I will uh, defer to answer in the end, okay? So what do you need to uh, do with me today? Uh, I'm expecting that you bring some motivation in actually learning um, or some motivation to do uh, something to make a difference. Uh, and uh, as we all also said in Old Dominion University, uh, if you want to become your own boss, right? So uh, you need to start at certain point. So maybe today is that starting point and you start thinking on how can you become your own boss and, uh, or how can you make a difference in, in, in the life of other people? And, and we will see this more in detail uh, next. For that, what we need, uh, what you need is to find a problem. And uh, uh, I, I laugh because I, uh, I am one of those that have a mindset of trying to seek for problems everywhere. And, uh, and so that I can see if, if it is a good idea to try to solve it or not. And, and, um, and of course, if there is an entrepreneurial uh, effort that can be put out of those problems. Um, and problems are always, uh, people see problems in a, in a negative way. And of course, because they generate sometimes negative consequences. Uh, but the mindset uh, that I, I hope that many people will have is that uh, problems actually bring an opportunity to, uh, to do better. As I always said to my students and, and my friends and my colleagues, uh, tell me what I'm not doing wrong, uh, right uh, so that I can have an opportunity to do it better. And uh, if, you, if you only tell me what I'm doing right, I have no opportunity to do better. So I always prefer that somebody comes and say, this is what the project is doing wrong. This is what's not working rather than, oh, all this thing is working, which again, it fits your ego or, or make you feel better, but hey, we're to do, here to do business, right? So if you tell me these areas are not working well, then I can go and work on them. The, the more time that pass in between, you had that bad experience and I go and correct it, the worst, right? So, Anna, but for that, we need to develop what is called the elephant skin, right? So that we open up ourselves to collect feedback and we don't take it personal and we take it in a professional way. And, and there is a, a full article of, on this that you can look into it. It's, it's in Harvard Business Review and it's called uh, Fear of Feedback and how you can actually build that elephant skin so that you can collect feedback early on without affecting your emotions and the emotions of the one that is providing feedback to you. Anyway, going back to uh, the presentation. So in point B, what I'm saying is that I would like you to have a problem that you would like to address. And that could be 
something that can lead into a, a, a new system. And we we're gonna we're gonna talk about what a new system is, or a new process, a new product, or a full full new solution. And uh, uh, and and this usually is the result of implementing what is called uh, this, the SWOT analysis, which is doing an analysis of what are the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the and the threats of a particular work unit. And that work unit can be you, can be your team, can be the department that you work on, your family, your company if you own one. So, uh, and, and it's a nice exercise to articulate what are potential areas for you to look as being a problem and start trying to enhance them uh, or solve them through a uh, agile innovation design thinking process. And, uh, and I'm gonna be talking about this process like a agile thinking process, an agile challenge, a design challenge, but they all mean pretty much the same. Um, so, uh, and then of course, I will ask you to come up with questions of how can we solve this particular problem, okay? In, in design thinking, and, and, in, and in innovation, actually in pure research, we always start with a question, something that we want to try to find out more uh, about and that will lead or focus in project management term, scope your efforts. Because you don't wanna go out of that area because you will be uh, losing time, effort, and, uh, and you'll be rambling all around and, and not accomplishing nothing. So the question makes you focus. The question uh, makes you, uh, provides you with the opportunity to build a consensus on, on your team of what is that you are supposed to do and what is what you are not supposed to do. And if you are doing something that you are not supposed to do, you are actually adding risks to the team. Uh, so, this is the entrepreneur question uh, that is usually how can I make money? And, uh, and entrepreneurs are all the time, as I said, outside trying to find opportunities for them uh, to put a, a new product service process out or a new solution to make money out of that. And, uh, and they uh, are risk takers because they actually invest uh, time and money and, uh, into trying to come up with an offering that will later on, of course, become a, a, a business somehow. It could be because they develop a solution and they patent the solution and then they license that solution for somebody else to uh, produce and they collect uh, 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 revenues or royalties from, from that license. Or they just go and open, uh, create a solution, invent a solution, and then they open their own company and run with it and uh, without licensing to to anybody. And um, so I'm just putting a couple of questions there. How can uh, skiers die from, uh, uh, how can we develop something to uh, avoid skiers dying in avalanches? Or how can I <laughs> solve the problem of people eating my lunch when I leave it in the office fridge? So uh, those are problems, right? And, and they all have a potential solution. And this is the other um, type of, uh, questions that we can ask. And this is the social entrepreneur. How can we help people? And um, how can we provide light into low-income families in rural areas to enhance the quality of life? Uh, how can we avoid kids to harm themselves with blades using desk fans? The, the cool side of, of social entrepreneur is that he or she focus on helping others. And sometimes they open companies that are um, non-for-profit but non-for-profit doesn't mean that they don't generate revenues because these are companies and these companies need to sustain themselves and pay the people that work in the companies. And there's a bad misconception about what is a non-for-profit uh, and, and, and a non-for-profit needs to be actually profitable to sustain itself and continue growing and to help people. It's the focus of what it is, which is focusing on helping people and uh, not, and, and, the owners actually are not cashing the money and, and make a profit because 
it has only people working to make sure that those products or services are helping people. And the next question, the entrepreneur. So many of us have uh, work in organizations and as part of our work, uh, we have been uh, tasked to solve problems and to uh, perform the normal duties of your, your position. Uh, but many times we are given the opportunity to probably come up with something that can enhance the performance and capabilities of our employer. And that's what I say of becoming an entrepreneur. So developing solutions uh, to problems or protection problems to help our, our employers. And uh, so uh, how can I help my employer? How can the company that I work make better toothbrush, make a news more enjoyable, make, make shopping carts better? And, uh, or enhance the, the business so that they generate more revenues and have a, a more healthy financial um, performance. So, but in the end, is what is your problem? And what I would like you to think about today is what type of hat do you want to wear? The entrepreneur heart or the social entrepreneur heart or the entrepreneur heart? So uh, pick a problem and let's try to solve it. So here's one, I have a few uh, slides. I like to put some uh, pictures sometimes in my presentations. So here's a problem that I can bet that pretty much everybody have had. So fighting for your unrest in, in, a, in an airplane. But here's a so cool, easy, low tech solution for that particular problem. So with this, what I'm trying to say is that you don't need to become a, um, an engineer, you don't need to have a PhD to actually come up with a really good product or solution. Uh, actually, if I can tell, the day that I got my PhD, my professor told me, great, Rafael, you just demonstrate that you can spend uh, three years of your life living as a student to get a degree, but you are not smarter than anybody else on the street. So uh, my point is uh, to become a uh, designer of new solutions, you just need to have a good understanding of what the problem is. And I'm going to be talking about that later. So what do you need to create something like this? Probably zero degrees. And, uh, and it's actually a really good solution that you can make money out of it. People dying of an avalanche. So somebody came up and designed this really cool thing. It's an airbag. It's a backpack and inflates when the, the sensors uh, feel that you have been tumbling. So... Uh, the cool thing about this technology is that they didn't invent anything. They didn't invent the sensors. They didn't invent the, the airbags. They are just repurposing technologies to solve a particular problem. And today we are at that point in, in our history, of humankind, in which we have so much power with sensors. We have a computer in our hands all the time. And, uh, and so many things that have been created that we can repurpose or package those technologies to solve particular problems. So um, what about kids in Africa needing to walk half a day, to go to a well, get water, and then come back half a day and boil it in the afternoon so that they can consume? It's just uh, crazy. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a really tough problem. So but a group of engineers actually came up with this nice bike of many, many years ago. Uh, but the beauty of this was that when when they defined the problem, they set the parameters or the constraints of the problem very clear. It needs to be a bike that's going to function in a, a harsh environment. So it needs to have tires that cannot puncture. Um, it needs to be uh, uh, easy of maintenance and, and it needs to help move water from point A to point B, right? And that's what the tank in the back is. And uh, but you see a tank with clear water in the front. So the engineers, what design is, is a pump that as they pedal, it actually sucks the water from the uh, back tank, push it to a set of filters and actually uh, clean it and become drinkable by the time that they get back to uh, their um, uh, home, to their village. So uh, the point about this technology is a little bit more complex than the one before, uh, but still 
really low tech in terms of there is no computer, no electricity uh, needed to, uh, to do this, this type of solution, to build this type of solution. What about this one? So this is low tech. I mean, this is talking about low tech. This is probably the lowest on, on low tech that we can actually talk. And uh, just a few days ago, I saw also a string that had a, a, a little hand that you can actually wrap around your page and put uh, and, and you move up and down that that finger to locate where you actually the last line where you actually uh, left the book and then you close and when you open it you have that showing uh, uh, where you were at so we all have problems every day and problems may require high tech and a lot of effort to come up with a solution or very low tech to come up with a solution like the one that, that we have it is one, it's a social entrepreneur trying to bring light to families. And probably you have seen this before, but this is a Coke uh, bottle that has a little bit of, of chlorine to keep the water uh, uh, sanitized. And, uh, and no algae will grow inside. And if you put it in the ceiling, it actually, uh, it's like a 55 uh, bulb, uh, uh, light bulb. And, and and the real reason why this is important is because mosquitoes tend to uh, um, beat more in areas that uh, are dark and, uh, and this actually uh, help. This one is more high tech. And uh, somebody was working in this turbine and build this extra skeleton, if you can call, where he can actually sit and, uh, and without a chair, which is, I think, super cool. Uh, more high tech. The helmet of a bicycle, of a motorcycle, you have a camera going, uh, looking forward, backwards, uh, and you have an integrated system that will show, um, have a microphone and you can have your uh, phone uh, uh, play music and, and, and a map showing. It's, it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's not new technology because it already exists, but it's an, a problem that requires that. This was a more complex uh, solution, if I might say, but let me explain you how they actually frame, and, and this is the important part about this slide, how they frame the problem. So it, was, uh, it, is, fa it, it is a fact that if, um, if you have a heart attack and your uh, heart stop, uh, after six minutes, of your brain not receiving uh, oxygen, your brain will start dying, okay? The big issue is uh, if you are in a location where an ambulance cannot reach you faster than five, six minutes, then you're gonna have some brain damage, right? And um, the average of an ambulance getting anywhere uh, is usually about 10 minutes. So there you go. You have now a problem actually based on pure data. So you can go into the, the uh, medicine journals and look into when the brain starts dying after a heart attack, and you can actually go into cities and find out what is the average of, um, of um, an ambulance reaching to a patient. So um, these students from a university in the Netherlands uh, came up with the idea of providing uh, uh, the public with a solution that can help uh, to have a response <clears throat> to a patient having a heart attack uh, with a defibrillator, which is the solution that we use in these type of problems. And uh, uh, so the solution was to create this drone that uh, House a houses a, a defibrillator and that can fly super fast to a particular location. And if you strategically place them in a city, in different areas, uh, they can actually you can actually pretty much plan for a response of less than five minutes. So that's what they did, and uh, it is way more complicated like that because they actually now. Um, tie the system with 911 and somebody will actually tell you over, over the speakerphone how to place the, the, 
uh, how, how to pro properly uh, use the defibrillator and uh, while you're waiting for an ambulance. Use a GPS, use all technology that we know. There isn't, and that's the other beauty about this, this uh, technology. They didn't invent nothing. They repurposed technology that, that already exists and built a full solution. Okay, so now more, uh, more fun. Uh, we all have been there and we hope that we had a time to, that we can just black out and, ha and had a quick nap in an airport So, uh, or in the library. This one is super cool. And uh, this actually developed technology. What you see in the front is actually a urine analyzer for babies. And what it does is that it, the colors tells uh, what type of, of uh, illness the baby may have in the urine. And the QR code, when you point at it and take a picture, it completely uh, immediately connects with the uh, office of the doctor and the doctor get the data of how the baby is doing. For those that were questioning about that question that I posed about how to prevent somebody to steal my lunch from my office <laughs> fridge, here's why. And the cool thing about this is that you can probably do it yourself at, at home with a little bit of spray and, uh, and just try it. Just put it there and see somebody actually can, can go and say, throw away this sandwich because it's bad. What about babies in their fingers? And I, as I did many times in, uh, in fans, so Dyson came up with this really cool design. And, um, people sometimes find their own way of doing things, innovate. So why standing up if I can move my uh, sandals to keep my line in, in, in my place in line? Um, and this is a really cool one. You put foot in, in there, it compacts. And when it's fully compact, it sends a signal to the truck company to come and pick it up. What it did is that cities have reduced a humongous amount of money uh, in the fuel cost of, um, of uh, trucks, which is uh, uh, a big deal for, for, for cities. Uh, another easy one, very low technology, goes into art, see, figure out ways in which you can create nice uh, pieces. This guy should be NASA, uh, of, of how he's actually enhanced his truck to actually cut more um, area as he wants. Another important area with, with innovation is look at, at uh, what we are using as, uh, or, uh, as garbage or as that, that we are throwing away as, as ways for you to have a more cost, cost effective solution. Uh, this is how uh, people have been using plastic bottles to create art, walls, and, uh, and fences in uh, developing countries. Uh, here at the Old Dominion University, we had a student that was actually using uh, uh, jeans to repurpose, uh, uh, repurpose jeans to create actually clothes. And, uh, and there's a famous company called uh, uh, rare forms that use billboards and, and build uh, bags out of those. And uh, again, with that particular element of, of being a green organization, right? Uh, good for the environment, which is also important. So what I always say to, stu to students and, and people, if you want to identify a problem that can make you a lot of money, not necessarily an easy problem to solve. It's try to solve any of these three, three problems, which is the biggest fears of anybody watching this uh, uh, presentation right now. But what's a project? A project is a temporary organization that has a start day and end day, that has a budget, that has a team, uh, that has certain objectives, that has a certain a set of constraints that we define them as resources constraints and performance constraints that uh, helps uh, somebody to uh, come up with a uh, solution, a new pro product, or, or helps to organize work to come up uh, to achieve certain goals, certain objects, okay? So we're using this definition into what is called a design uh, thinking agile innovation projects. 
it's important to know is that we have many different types of projects. And uh, uh, there are projects that produce new systems. And again, this could be a new product, a new process, a new service, or a new solution, which is product, process, and service all together. And, uh, and this is a new system of research and development, an old system applied in new ways, or new completely system acquisition, inter installation, and integration in something that already exists. So uh, for example, you just bought a new uh, har um, uh, hardware to your, um, uh, to your computer, and uh, hard drive, excuse me. So that's a good explanation of a project that requires acquisition, installation, and integration. Uh, could be system maintenance in which you are cleaning uh, your uh, piano, cleaning your uh, screen, uh, there could be a major uh, system uh, enhancement project uh, that uh, is when, um, when you are bringing back to operational uh, capabilities a, a, a given uh, system. For example, uh, ships sometimes uh, during their life cycle are bring back to, to, uh, to the dock and they change pretty much everything inside and then put it out. Uh, that's an overhaul. But again, regularly they come and a few technologies are changed, not necessarily being a full overhaul. And there might be some other type of projects. As I say, that any project start has a start date and a final date, and there are phases that we go throughout the project. And, uh, and we're gonna focus on these phases as, as we talk about design thinking. Um, so what are the different approaches in producing new systems or new solutions, if we may call it? Um, if we think about Bill Gates, or if we think about Steve Jobs, they had a vision of how uh, we were gonna do some computations in the future. The vision of, of, uh, uh, of Microsoft was to have a, a computer in every household in the country. And uh, while well, Steve Jobs was more into uh, the the end user experience and all that. But they start with a vision of what is what they want to provide the customer. Then they build it, they design it, they launch the system and then have a marketing campaign trying to find customers. Uh, not necessarily really good uh, for anybody that really don't understand what's going on. Uh, it means that we are predicting what, customer, what customers need, which uh, may not necessarily be a good way to approach a project. Approach B is same thing. There is a vision, but this one is a little bit more smart if you think, uh, because they build what is called a minimum viable product or prototype that have all the basic functions, not necessarily all the, the whistles and, and corks of, 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 of a final product, but just the basics and, uh, and they produce that and give it to a customer to collect early feedback of what the customer thinks about. And then they iterate and when it's ready, when the customer say this is good, then they launch it uh, to the market. Uh, the next one is when the customer comes with an idea, but it's not quite well-defined and one somebody to help to solve it. So the customer and the project together define what is that thing that they're going to produce. And they go through the same type of iteration. They build minimal viable product and then iterate until it's ready and then deliver to the customer. And, uh, next one, approach E, uh, customer comes with a better idea of what they want. and. Uh, and provide a close uh, order with requirements uh, that are, as I said, very well defined, but they provide flexibility so that we still, as a project, have an input on what we believe is, is what they want. And um, again, it produces a minimal viable product and then iterates with their feedback until it's ready and is delivered. Next one, the F approach is completely close for the input of the project. 
It starts with a clear one to 10 requirements that we need to produce. And if we are actually out of those requirements, we actually can get sued by the customer uh, because that's usually put in the contract. Uh, but it's the same thing. They provide us, we will need this and they collect feedback through their minimum viable product and little by little build the final product and it's then delivered. So you may be thinking, where are we going? And uh, where is D? So D is the design thinking approach. It's different than all these approaches that I just talked about. And it starts with understanding the end user needs. And out of those needs, then I build a minimum viral product and then use their uh, feedback to enhance it and then launch it. Uh, you may see that the middle point is pretty much the same. What is different is the starting point. So you may get later on in any of the other approaches where the, the design thinking approach will end, but the design thinking approach will get there faster and makes you spend less money and be more effective and efficient, okay? Besides the approach, design thinking some, have some other things that uh, um, are important to mention, okay? So what's it I'm thinking? It uses human-centered approaches to innovations and uh, to draw from uh, the designers toolkits and, uh, and brings technology and the human side all together to uh, create really cool solutions. That's pretty much it. And uh, you cannot detach design thinking from technology and you cannot detach the design thinking from the human side. It is actually a combination of the two. And, uh, and it's super cool to uh, just look about, uh, to experience. Uh, you can read about it, uh, you can watch videos about it, but to experience design thinking gives you a completely different uh, perception of what actually is. Uh, that's kind of a nice uh, part, I think, of what actually is. You can move in certain instances, the, the red area more to the left or the blue area more to the right, and uh, uh, depending on what type of problems that you're trying to solve. So keywords that define design thinking, value creation, value proposition, creative confidence. One of the things that people have uh, demonstrated is that they feel that they are not creative, and, uh, and that's not true. Uh, everybody has the capability to create new things. And, uh, when you give them the right conditions. Creations means that we have always a team help us do this. And the team can be in different shapes. Uh, one of the shapes is the T design, which means with the horizontal part of the T is that they have a broad knowledge of the phenomenon or the problem that we're talking about. And in the vertical side of the T is that they have depth of knowledge with respect to what it is that we're talking about. So, uh, for example, somebody that has a management uh, uh, experience in, in technology, but is a uh, mechanical engineer, or is an electrical engineer, or is an accountant. So it has very specific knowledge with respect to a particular area. And, uh, or, or zero degrees, just experiences it actually works well. Iterations, uh, iterating, it's a, it's a mindset that we need to develop. That goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, that we cannot predict the future. And therefore, to mitigate the risks of doing something wrong and invest and put a humongous amount of money up front, and then later on find out that it was the wrong approach, what we do is that we break it in pieces. And the smaller the pieces, the better. And we call those iterations. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, learning happens everywhere. So design thinking, dealing innovation projects, innovation is pure about learning and learning as fast as we can. Permission to fail. Uh, you're coming to uh, becoming an innovator or you're coming into becoming an entrepreneur and you think that you are not going to fail, uh, you are in the wrong uh, uh, field. The, uh, the de facto part of it, the nature of innovation and of entrepreneurship is that you are going to fail. And uh, actually, there was a, a really cool story that I heard 
of the president of Babson uh, uh, College, which is the top one university in, in, the, in the world in entrepreneurship. And in one of his addresses to parents, he actually told them that, <laughs> that he was ex expecting that, that students fail a lot and during, the, <laughs> during their time at Babson, and that was not well received because not everybody really understands what that means. And uh, only entrepreneurs and innovators will understand that that's the only way that you're gonna get there. And uh, but don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that you're gonna lose millions of dollars. It means that you're going to um, fail in a very systematic way. And we're gonna talk about that later. Now, another very important thing is to have the ability to transport your thoughts in the future or in the past by looking at first and second and third or fifth orders of effect of what happened or what could happen. Uh, if you tell me one of the things that I always see nowadays of, of people falling short is that ability to see far out of the next decision or two decisions or three decisions ahead. Those are the really, really uh, 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 innovators, the ones that are capable to see far out in the future or far out in, in, in the past and that are able to see relationships between elements of your problem and see how this may impact this, which impact this, which impact this, and then that will come back and it will bite my back and that's not good. So let me go and be sure that, that I go and, and fix this before we actually get there. So, and, uh, and, and that's a, again, a, a, an important part of, of design thinking and being an innovator. Design thinking is a very simple process. Now going into the meat of, of, of the presentation. Start with a problem, right? And uh, next question is, how, how might we solve the problem? The next question is, how can we take action? From this. this is design thinking. Problem, how might I solve the problem? And how can I actually start doing something to solve the problem? What I'm gonna do today is to decompose these three phases into many different parts. And it will add many different elements that will help us to do this in a more systematic way, if you call. So uh, sometimes we define a problem, but when we try to solve it, we realize that the problem was not well defined. So we need to go back to redefine the problem. And, uh, and then same thing we, when we have a prototype, we need to go back and, <clears throat> and come up with new ideas because it didn't work. So it's not a linear process, it's an iterative process. And these are iterations, these are phases. And you can be in this, iterations for quite some time, not necessarily, again, straight line, fixed ex expectation of what's going to happen. So in what is the problem? Uh, pretty much what we're doing is doing research. And um, doing research on what? In understanding the needs of those that are facing the problem. So um, uh, it means that a problem has people experiencing the problem and some others trying to solve, which is the design thinking process. So, uh, and we have many different processes on how we do research to understand the need and, and uh, pinpoint what are those needs. And we're gonna talk about that later. And how, we might, how might we solve the problem is the invention process. So in, where, in which we generate ideas and uh, not necessarily uh, those ideas are the final ideas, but uh, we start inventing within the constraints of the problem, right? Within the scope of the problem. And um, finally, those ideas are implemented, become solutions, and that's what we call the innovation process. The difference between invention and innovation that you can invent something that has no applicability to solve anybody's problem. And there are many different things that you can see online uh, that people have invented that has zero application whatsoever. It's only when what you invented is applied to 
easy to solve a problem that you become an innovator. And, uh, and that's part of why these feedback loops are important to feedback in your idea generation and feedback in the definition of your problem. Along the whole process, as I said, is pure high level learning happening and uh, learning by feedback, like learning uh, before things happen, but it's pure learning. And, uh, and we learn before things happen by doing simulation, by the way. But design thinking agile project, um, a long title, uh, you try to do it right. It's design thinking agile project innovation challenge. Um, an innovation challenge of thinking, I mean, you can put all these words in different ways. To me, pretty much means the same. So I always refer to a design project, design thinking project, and agile design project. You can change all, all the orders of these uh, words and pretty much means the same. You have a design thinking team or a development team. Uh, you have a funded contract or is you on your own time trying to become your own boss. It has a project manager or an agile project manager or a design manager or an a single person responsible for the performance of this project. Um, it has a place, but they call it a war room. Some other people call it a knowledge room where people can put stickers on the walls and can uh, co-create, be close to one another. Of course, now in the pandemic time, everything is virtual. And it has a time box. And uh, the time box is a nice um, concept to define time constraints. It box you in terms of time. And, and these time boxes help you to uh, make sure that you are on track. Uh, so time boxes, as I say, constraint of time be defined by the customer, by the team, by the organization, uh, helps you to focus on a particular item within that time box, not necessarily all the solution, all the functions, all the things that you want to do in, in, in your project. Um, the amount of time depends on many different things. What is the capacity of your team? Uh, is this an urgent solution or not? How much time do you really have? And, uh, and what are the available resources? If you don't have a good connection to computers, if you don't have uh, availability to, to build prototypes, then you are all limited, right? And most important thing about time boxes is that we always prefer the shorter one. Uh, why? Because if if you fail in that time box, you only committed a small amount of time and only committed a, a small amount of resources. Uh, but you achieve something really important, which is learning of what doesn't work. So you can apply it in your next uh, uh, iteration, your next time box. So uh, so we work in small commitments. Uh, and we, as I said, if we fail, we fail in a control way. But if we expand these three phases into actually steps, uh, we see now what has been uh, put out as, as a more uh, articulated design thinking process. Start with understanding, ideation, selection of the best idea, we prototype the idea, and we validate the idea with the customer. It's that simple. And if you ask me what's the difference between this and engineering, there's no difference. This is pretty much engineering. We understand your problem, come up with ideas, design it, uh, select your best idea, prototype them, and validate them. It looks like a linear process, but again, these are iterations. And at certain points of time, you, need, you can go back. Uh, however, if you do this thing right since the beginning, then uh, you should not uh, be looking into going back in phases uh, unless your project has become completely not viable anymore. And we can talk about that later. Okay. So three different ways in which we can link project management or agile project management and design thinking is how we're going to do these phases. And there are three different ways in which we can do it, depending on, again, available resources, available infrastructure, how capable the team is, um, what are the needs of your client by when they need a solution, how urgent it is, how much money are they giving you, uh, how how much do they know 
what the problem is, because if not, you need to do a lot of front end work to try to define their needs. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, what is that system that you are producing and how complex it is? And uh, all that will influence uh, how you would like to do these phases. So approach one is a full design thinking project. It's a full, uh, excuse me, a full design thinking phase is a project. So you go all the way from understanding to validation and we call that a project. Or understanding becomes one project, ideation and selection, another project, and prototyping and validation, another project. Or each of these, it's its own project. And, uh, and remember, a project is what? A temporary organization with a team, with objectives, and uh, um, with a time constraint. And, uh, so you may actually have different teams doing different phases of design thinking, uh, depending on how you actually do it. So in terms of time boxes, it could be something like this. So full week, five days, will be a full design thinking project. Or uh, an hour and 40 minutes will be a full design thinking project. Or two and a half days could be a design thinking project. So of course, you may actually be thinking now, hey, Prof, but you're not going to uh, come up with the cure of cancer in one and a half hours or in a single week. And that's truth. Uh, so when you constrain your time boxes, you're also constraining the amount of things that you can actually do because the research uh, that you will do in understanding is not going to be that extensive. Uh, but you will produce something in the end, okay? Even if what you produce was just pure understanding. And that's the goal of Agile, that you produce something in, at the end of your iteration, and of design thinking that you produce something that has some value to somebody, right? So, um, uh, so let's start working. And, uh, and this is where you, I will need you to think about a particular problem. You would like to... Um, run through the next hour that, that we will have together our um, yeah about an hour um and uh and it will go fast in the next slides um, i'll give you one minute to think about something that you would like to do just pick something that is not necessarily super complex or or if that's what you would like to do that's good so so one minute every time that you see the yellow box means that I stop talking and you start doing. Thirty seconds. <clears throat> Okay, so I hope that you have a good idea of something that you would like to, to run through this workshop or two or three uh, potential problems that you can switch. Let's start with understanding. So what's understanding? Uh, in this understanding process, this is what we're gonna do. So we start with an initial, initial design challenge question um, of, hey, how can we do this particular task better? How can I solve this particular problem? That's your general uh, design uh, challenge question. Uh, usually what happens is that then you will find a team or define a team that can help you with 
answering that question. Sometimes the team comes first, and sometimes it comes later, uh, 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 again, after you define the question. But I'm, I decided to do this because I think that this is the more rational way of doing it. So there is a problem, and then you go and def def define the team that's going to try to solve the problem. And that team then next is going to work into refining that design question uh, based on what they know. And uh, then they, the, the team goes and collect data, try to understand the data, produce what is called insights or conclusions, pretty much. Insights is, is, is a, it's a fancy way of saying conclusions. And then uh, generates a final uh, design challenge question that we will use to generate ideas in our next phase. Okay, so as you see, it has four different steps uh, that are gonna happen. And the first and the second, it may actually vary on which one is the first and the second. Uh, but the basics of understanding, we collect data, we put data together to become information or structured data. We give meaning to the data and we call that raw knowledge. And then we try to understand how that data applies to me, to my problem. And that's what we call integrated knowledge. And a, a quick example is I give you two or three data points of how much money are you spending in the last three, four months, and that's data. But if I then put them against time, we can see the trend of the data, right? Uh, and that line may go up or that line may go down or that line may be flat or maybe a cyclical. Uh, and that's the next step in which you say, oh, that means that it is a positive trend and I'm spending more, or it's a negative trend and I'm spending less, or I'm really good at keeping my budget. And the final step is, what does that mean to you? It means that I'm handling my money well, so I'm going to have more money in the future, or I'm really out of control, or I need to ask for a loan. And that's the final part. So, uh, but there is three critical points with respect to building understanding. What is the data? How available it is? How valid that data is? And how much data you actually have? What is your absorbent capacity? And or is the capacity to understand the data so that it becomes information, raw knowledge, and integrated knowledge? And uh, what is that uh, brain power that you have? And also, what is the bias that you may have to understand the data? So those are important aspects. And then again, the same thing that I said before is the system thinking. How can I think in several orders of effect to understand my data? Uh, think in the future and things in, uh, in the past uh, so I can collect a better understanding of the cost effect that has happened in a particular problem. So here's some example. I saw a black mouse in my bedroom two months ago. And again, this, I mean, this is, this is uh, hypothetical. I don't have mice in my house. So I saw a black mouse in my bedroom two months ago. I saw a white mouse last week. I saw two gray today, so black white, gray, and I live over a restaurant. So that's pure data. And you see, they are not, it seems like they are not related, right? That's not true. So if I put this uh, in, a, in a chart against time, the number of mouse or mice that I see is increasing. And uh, I actually see them at night. So that's another uh, piece of information. So uh, when we put all that together, it means that they are reproducing because I saw a black one, then I saw a white one, then I saw gray ones. Hmm, they might be reproducing, right? But if there is an asterisk there. And there's another thing, another bullet that say I have an infestation. And uh, the great knowledge means that my best control efforts are not, work, not working and that I may not be able to sell the house if I need to because I have an infestation and there's two asterisks there. So uh, again, it's an example, but I just want you to pay attention to the asterisk because I am actually claiming in the raw knowledge uh, phase that the mice are reproducing. And I'm going to put a question out, do you really think that they're reproducing? Uh, 
I have not seen them reproducing, so this is actually not a fact, which in design thinking, you need to abolish as much as you can. So when you are trying to build understanding of your problem, the first thing that you need to get away is uh, statements that are not necessarily facts. How are they uh, are grounded in data? So this statement is not, not grounded anywhere, so it needs to be put out of our uh, design thinking process. Same thing with respect to, I cannot sell the house in integrated knowledge. Really? So there might be people out there that actually like mice and may like to have a, a, a lab inside, inside your house. So you cannot rule this thing out and therefore you are making a statement that is not grounded in data and needs to be put out of your understanding of your problem. So understanding uh, is first step is critical to actually come up with a um, uh, 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 scope of what is what you are actually trying to, to solve. And, uh, and you will never have an ideal understanding process. And that's the most important part that you need to understand here. Because to really get to understand something fully, you will need to spend hundreds of days, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of dollars, a lot of technology, and this is not exactly what we're looking for here. Uh, we're looking forward to have maybe an iteration where you try to go deep and understand your problem. Uh, right now, I I'm working with a, a, a group of, of alumni in a, in a design thinking effort that started three years ago. And I'm going to use this as I, I move forward to, to in the next slide because it provides you a lot of, of uh, uh, context. And we were getting into the, um, the smart home industry. And in particular, as I go into the air quality of enclosed facilities. Uh, I never went through any course on that. And the other person was an electrical engineer and the other person was a business uh, uh, graduate. So none of us had an idea of what air quality was. But we spent three months, a full summer in 2016, just doing as much reading as you can think and comparing notes and presenting our, our findings to really understand what pollutants uh, in, in, uh, in the air of an enclosed facility actually was. Uh, Lucky to us, that leads out to COVID right now, and 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 that effort became a company, and and we are getting a lot of attention. But my point is, three months just pure understanding our problem when we were not that close to the problem. So, another important thing uh, with respect to understanding is that we need to go and and and, and talk to people, observe what's going on, right? So. When you go and observe somebody that is pretty much doing this in, in, a, in a daily uh, uh, operation, that's not necessarily the best source of data for you. You would like to see somebody that is actually not doing it all the time and somebody that is on the other extreme, that is super good. And there is an example that is always put out that is used widely, which is a, a idea of trying to, to come up with a new design of, of kitchen tools and what they actually did was to give uh, kitchen tools to kids and actually uh, and observe them and give them to uh, chefs and observe them. Uh, but they didn't actually go and look into uh, uh, somebody at home normally cooking food. And why? Because normal people tends to develop behavior to go through uh, the adaptation of their uh, 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 body or, or the behavior to a particular problem. But when you look at the streams, then you see, for example, a kid ha handling a, a toothbrush, instead of how we're doing it, they actually handle it like this and they just go like this. So uh, um, that's why they redesigned the toothbrush. So uh, when you go and try to understand a problem uh, and, uh, and make observations, try to go to the extremes, not to, to the normal user that is experiencing the problem. Um, so there's a phrase that say, watch what users don't do and listen to what they don't say. 
that's where you will find the opportunities to come up with really good ideas. And that observation to develop understanding is not about quantity, it's about quality of the observation. So the less number of observations, uh, but a higher quality will provide you more information, more data, and more understanding that going in a full bloom of thousands of people and going up and observe a thousand of, 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 of uh, subjects doing a particular uh, uh, task. Very important uh, with this slide, what I'm trying to say is that learning is to happen through time, but, at, but the sooner that it happens, the better, right? So having a highly capable team will enhance the absorbing capacity and data collection capabilities than having a low capable team. Uh, it really speed up your uh, understanding and help you to gain time. Also important is how knowledgeable were there when they start in this process. I put our example in which we knew zero. If we have given anybody the task of, of signing census and all that for air quality, they were gonna be probably higher than us. So th this goes back to that theory that you would like to always do uh, become an entrepreneur or an innovator in something that you already know, because you will have that background knowledge that not anybody else will have. So, but it doesn't impede you to actually start learning about uh, a particular problem. The difference, as you see, is how much will you, you will be learning in a particular point of time against somebody. And we all know that anybody has... Uh, a, we all come up with very much similar ideas. If you think that you right now have the real, real good idea that nobody else have had in the rest of the world, I'll say, no, that's not true. Probably somebody in Africa or in, in Europe have the same idea that you're having right now. And uh, the difference is who's going to implement it that we're gonna talk about that later. So that leads us to what is that team that you are going to build? And it's so critical because we cannot do this ourselves. Uh, it will take us so much time, so much effort. It's not impossible, but nobody has come up with really super cool ideas all by themselves. They always need somebody to provide some support. Even Albert Einstein was help, getting help from uh, mathematicians. So your design team, hopefully are subject matter experts in the area. It's a small team, five to nine, integrated, Post-functional, coming from different disciplines, um, uh, they estimate this is what they need to produce the functions, how long it will take. Uh, they actually define how those are going to be developed. And I like uh, this quote from Steve Jobs, which, which is, I think is just brilliant. It does not make sense to hire small people and tell them what they need to do. Hire them so that they tell you what you need to do. So when you have a team, you have a team of, of experts that they each come from different uh, sides to actually inform the decision-making process, the understanding process. And they estimate the work because they, they actually know how, how long it will take. They can tell you how fast the team can go, how slow the team can go. They, close, they work closely with the customer. And uh, there's not necessarily a leader in the team. Leadership is emerging. And with this, what I'm saying is that you may have a convener, and a convener is somebody that just collect the agenda, sends a, uh, the minutes out, and keeps the team working together, but he's not necessarily the leader. It's just a convener. Or you can have somebody that has more power, that is a coordinator that defines how, what the team is doing and where the team is going. Or you can have a project manager that has a full control upon what's happening, who's coming, and how things actually happen. Uh, but when you talk about an agile team, it's a team in which the leadership is flat and depending on the situation, somebody raised as, as a leader, lead the team and goes back as a team member and then happens again with somebody else. And, and it's actually beautiful when you see it happening because the team has zero bureaucracy and it's all, always focused on producing value. So he commits and it's very critical that in every iteration they commit actually do some work, makes uh, all the status visible to everybody, self-organized depending on the situation, uh, defines when something has been completed and, uh, and deliver value to the customer 
in iterations in, in the phases and uh, defines the norms of, of belonging to the team and um, and also uh, follows the agile uh, process that I'm going to show you in, in two more bullets ahead. Um, uh, they dedicated, hopefully, in, in, in this team for a long time so that they learn and develop how to work together, which is important in, in innovation. And, um, and goes through this process of daily meetings, uh, daily checks on, on where we are, uh, planning where we're going in, the, in this uh, iteration, uh, doing the work, very important, demo and validating, and then reviewing and collecting understanding and go back to this cycle of iterations that can last between a week or two weeks, three weeks, depending on, on the time. Uh, Self-organizing are different than traditional. A traditional team goes uh, in, a, in a systematic step-by-step -step <clears throat> with, no, with little feedback uh, from requirements from the customer all the way to testing and deliver. In Agile, we have everybody in the team providing us knowledge ahead of time of what will happen. Uh, how are we gonna test if we are designing right now our product? So uh, if we're gonna build an engine, how are we going to lift the engine? So we need to have certain areas where we're going to be able to host the, the engine up and move it. So this is pretty much what I'm talking about. We have integrated cross-disciplinary team. In the team may have actually membership that is extended. So these members can come and go depending on the situation of the team, but they are part of the team. And uh, uh, again, it, it helps, uh, and these are some theory behind, it helps raising problems in the team, uh, having strong functional uh, members that can help with lateral and vertical communication, that information is provided to the team to make decisions and enhance operations and learning. That's pretty much a high capable team. Um, it helps with different points of communication, having a network, collect ideas from other people and uh, bring in issues that they may know that will happen later in the development cycle up forward. And what we have seen in practice is that companies have been able to shave time, development time, and putting products out faster when you actually have cross-functional teams being the ones making the decision in a particular project. Now, we develop a, a social uh, intellectual capital and uh, that let them be way more efficient in the way of operations as they remain together throughout time. It's also bad because when you bring a new member, this new member doesn't know how that Team works and it may actually be a dysfunction in the team. And uh, uh, I'm going to skip this slide, but it pretty much defines what a integrated cross disciplinary team is, which is all that I said in a single statement. And these are not me. I'm, I'm, as you see, I'm quoting other researchers that have actually done this work. So now let's go into the initial uh, question. And, uh, and you're gonna be doing some work here. Uh, they, uh, you're gonna write uh, your initial design challenge question. We call that the first pass in one sentence, in a question format, then you're gonna rewrite it. Second pass, trying to consider in the context and constraints of the problem. Uh, what are your available capabilities, including time uh, and any other limitations. Then we're gonna do an assessment is this a good, narrow challenge question that will actually uh, push out any innovation uh, possible? Or is this too broad of a question that will just make even difficult to have different questions, uh, different uh, ideas related to one another? Then uh, a check is that if you can find a question that can produce five ideas in, in two minutes, you, you are in the, in the right the, the right track, okay? So write an initial question, rewrite it with some constraints, assess if it's too broad or too narrow by actually looking at how many questions you can actually, uh, how many ideas you can produce in two minutes. So uh, let me give you an example. How can I exterminate the mice in my house? That's my initial design challenge question that defines my problem, right? How can I exterminate the mice in my house? But 
I know that it's the first pass. So with top constraints, the trade is how can I exterminate the mice in my house without putting in danger my family? So, but is, is it ready yet? Well, I mean, to me, it is super broad. I can't come up with much any solution to this. It's just, it's just too broad, too fussy. I need to narrow it down a little bit more. So my narrow down one will be, how can I eradicate mice from my house without using chemicals that can affect my family and without mechanical dangerous devices that my uh, kids or my pets can put their fingers or their palms on it, uh, that is 10 by 10 uh, at, uh, cent centimeters at max. Uh, and I'm only gonna use uh, recyclable materials. That is a very focused, still broad design question that can help us to start producing ideas, okay? So, what I want you to do right now is take five minutes, and this is the longer that you're going to take today, to actually write your initial question. And uh, so starting right now, go through this process one to four and, uh, and have your uh, refined design challenge question. Okay. So uh, and I'll be back in five minutes. One minute.
Ten seconds. Okay, so um, hopefully you went through it and, and, and you started developing a more narrow, uh, but not necessarily too narrow uh, uh, design question. Uh, this process will be completely different when you are with a team. Uh, and that's important for me to say. It may take a little bit longer, but uh, you of course will use everybody's perspective to actually define it better. In particular, when you are actually uh, talking about the constraints and uh, uh, bringing people that have technical expertise in different areas will actually be uh, uh, super handy in this. In this. So uh, developing understanding the major difference uh, between the engineering process and the design thinking process is actually empathy. Uh, very few schools actually push the need for empathic design in engineering. And it's actually a, a trend nowadays in, in engineering schools, making sure that students don't actually produce something without putting themselves on the shoes of uh, an end user. And actually I am uh, guilty of that when I was doing my AS degree thesis I produce a bench, uh, and I actually measure six three, and uh, and I produce a bench for a six three person in Venezuela, where I'm actually super tall than everybody else. I'm not normal in, in Venezuela, and uh, and I produce a really big desk that uh, nobody could actually reach. So uh, bench. So again, it happens a lot of uh, uh, in in engineering, and and this is the part where in the engineering process and the design thinking process actually uh, uh, help one another. And uh, so when we do empathy, it's putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else, but not only that, it's actually not um, uh, judging the other person's uh, feelings or what they said. It's actually trying to put yourself in their mind to try to feel what they feel, see what they see, and hear what they hear. And uh, in that way, you are actually putting yourself in the end user's shoes and start collecting data, information that can develop that very rich understanding that can lead into actually producing the right ideas to solve their problems. And uh, of particular, uh, uh, for a particular example that I want to say here is uh, uh, there was this company that was trying to understand what happened in, in, in a hospital when, when a, a patient goes in and tried to speed up the process. And, and they sent a team that actually collected data, observed, but that was not enough. And uh, you know what they, they ended up doing? They actually have a person act like a patient and feed the person with microphones and cameras everywhere. And they capture all the patient experience from day one until the day that that he was actually uh, uh, released from the hospital. And, uh, and then the team sit down and capture from different angles what actually the experience was and collected data, really super rich data to understand the problem. And um, so uh, in doing, in, 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 in actually going through empathy, it's important to, uh, as, as I say, observe what they don't do and also listen to what they don't say. Uh, uh, and to make that, it's necessary that we have some level of inter interaction with, with the end user, right? So we do that through interviews, uh, sometimes service too. And, um, and we need to be super careful. And probably one of the things that I would like you to remember today is that be super careful when you actually ask questions to job subjects, because if you ask the wrong question, guess what you're gonna get? The wrong answer, right? Or sometimes they even don't speak because they don't understand what is what you're asking. So, um, and we always need to frame the questions in trying to understand the end user needs, and let me repeat that, needs, N-E-E-D-S. And that's the goal of design thinking. What are the end user needs? Bad thing about design thinking or engineering is when somebody jumps in 
and tells you this is what you need. And there's a, a very well-known quote from Henry Ford that said, if I have asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said that they want a faster horse. It uh, goes back to that original uh, approach in project management when, the, when you really know what, is, uh, uh, what they need versus uh, what you are actually pushing to them as what they need, and, uh, which is completely different. So in, in, in this pretty much what we're trying to say is that you want to ask your customers, uh, what are your needs? Because if Henry Ford have asked them, what are your needs? The actual needs was, I want to move from point A to point B and have this heavy load in my car. And not necessarily a horse is the right answer, right? So, and that's the difference. Needs versus what's needed. And we need to remain ourselves from what is needed in this process, in particular in the, in the understanding. So again, needs, that's the key word that I want you to remember with respect to design thinking. So you develop empathy, and you want to see what activities are happening around the, your subjects, what's the environment, what is in there, uh, how are its people interacting with the environment and interacting with other people, uh, what are the objects that they have and that they are using. Uh, in particular, we like to interview them so that you can start making a relationship between what they are doing and what they are thinking, between what they are saying and what they are really thinking, because all that leads down to feelings. How is that they feeling when they are experiencing the, a hospital uh, admission? Or how is that they are feeling when they come to class? Or how is that what they're feeling when they are at home and, and think that the air is actually no quality and is somebody infected with COVID? And, uh, uh, and why getting to the feeling is important? Because we as humans tend to have a connection with what we use and that means a product or a technology or a service. And our goal is try to get there, being super careful to don't use our bias on trying to see, okay, this is how they're feeling. No, let's uh, try to reduce your bias by having a multidisciplinary cross-disciplinary team that can give you different points of view, uh, use diversity, male, females, African-American, whites, Hispanics, so that you get a really rich perspective of what the data actually is. Um, so here's an example. Some of us that had the opportunity to see this in, in practice, this was many, many years ago in the, in the 1980s and early 90s. Um, uh, it was called a pan pilot. And you can actually, it's an agenda and you can do many different things what, like what you do right, uh, right now with your phone. Uh, but the interface, when you actually wrote a letter, it was not actually an A going up and down and across. It has a different way uh, uh, of sketching it. And, uh, and you need to learn how to write an A, a B, and the whole, uh, and, and, and the, and the whole um, uh, word that you want to, 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 to write. Uh, the issue was, I believe the user interface was super bad. But here's the thing, I'm gonna put you two subjects that use this uh, device. One is my brother that, I mean, he became an expert. He could write words in no time on this thing. And I put him on a far extreme as an expert. And the other subject is me. I bought one and pff, I barely use it. So um, what happened out of this? Well, we all know uh, that when they went and, and do interviews to pretty much all people that use it and ask them, how did they feel using a Palm Pilot? The answer was stupid. So that they were not technologically capable to actually go with the next wave of technology. And, uh, and of course he was doomed because he was pretty much hitting a, 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 a particular small uh, target in the population and it was not widely adopted. What about this one? You ask anybody with a smartphone, doesn't matter if it's Samsung or, or iPhone or whatever, a smartphone, and you ask them, how do they feel? What's the, what's the name? Smart, right? Smartphone. Makes you capable to do many other things. It can predict even the words that you're gonna write. 
So, uh, and we all know why this uh, is a big success. Even people can tell you that they have an emotional attachment to their uh, cell phone. And that's where I was going when you actually try to define understanding, going to that feeling that they have towards something, because then you can exploit as an entrepreneur, an innovator, into developing a, a, a solution that can develop those particular feelings. And uh, I'm going to have a slide on this coming up soon. Uh, here's another example. Uh, Procter & Gamble wanted to do big business in India. and. Uh, um, this is actually a case study in, in Harvard Business Review. And they, uh, they saw the opportunity in the big population that India has in actually having a um, hygiene product that, that can generate a lot of revenues. So, but they didn't go to the main cities uh, where the most population are actually folk, uh, uh, living. They look into the country areas to try to see what people in the country area needed. And what they found out is that males in those areas actually don't shave that often and they grow big beards and the nipples becomes really thick and big. And, and they thought that if they could offer something to help them uh, uh, and a very low cost, and you see all the constraints, men, uh, thick nipples, uh, uh, very low cost because these are people that not necessarily has a lot of, of, of uh, financial means to, to buy, but they understand the masses that if they were able to make this affordable to these millions of people, they would make a lot of money. So they designed a particular uh, 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 razor that can take thick nibbles that is cheap enough so that they can acquire it and they are making a lot of millions. So. Um, is another problem. I'm going to skip this one because we're running out of time. Uh, uh, it is so complex to try to come up with a solution for this problem. So I will always ask my students, look at this, make observations, and, and try to find out uh, what are the needs of the customer. Again, the needs, know what is needed, the needs of the customer to see if we can come up with a better way of doing this that we all do, and we have been in situations that uh, you are late, uh, you cannot get uh, that's your plan. So finally, you develop your um, final insight uh, or conclusions, which starts with a statement. User needs because of this. User needs in a way that produces this. User needs this. So that, so again, going back to Henry Ford, you said needs to go from point A to point B uh, as fast as they can because they are in a rush. User needs a way to transport heavy uh, equipment from point A to point B in a way that they don't kill themselves. So uh, this final slide is a template for you to move from understanding to ideation and it fits the ideation process. Uh, it provides with the user needs and it provides with why they need that, okay? So um, I'm gonna skip this and, uh, so that we move into um, ideation. So in ideation, uh, this could be a different phase. This could be a part of the whole process uh, with uh, the same team, uh, but whatever it is, you may actually need to enroll other people and that's okay because you are feeding them with a question that they will try to help you uh, answer with ideas. And uh, there is a famous phrase that somebody uh, uh, put out and it has become kind of like a common language but uh, that many people disagree, including myself, which is always oh, need to think out of the box. And, and, and with that, they refer to actually Losing yourself of any constraints and try to come up with ideas. Actually, that's very easy to do, uh, thinking out of the box. Really difficult is thinking inside the box when you need to come up with a, an innovative idea and you are pretty much constrained with so many policies, money, people, time, 
And now they're asking you, give me a solution. Uh, that's the difficult part. And, uh, and that's the reality. Uh, very few have the opportunity to be completely wide open, uh, even though, I mean, it can generate uh, some good ideas. So that's kind of like a, an utopia uh, on, in, in innovation. And uh, so we enroll others, we generate ideas, and we refine the ideas as we go. Um, six steps uh, for ideation. We bound the problem with a question. We prepare, prepare our brains of those that are going to be doing the, the, um, the um, uh, ideation. We will do brainstorming. We will select the ideas. We have individual reflection time, and then we have a final selection of idea. When we bound the problem, we ask a question that, again, the question provides the scope of what we're doing or not. And we saw that when we talk about the mice uh, and with that conclusion of user needs this because of that. Um, it's very, very important that, that the question only describe the needs, not means or methods or tools. Uh, and uh, uh, be careful again of being too abstract or uh, too broad or too very narrow. Uh, the second part that we talk about number one already, second part is the most important part for what I believe is the uh, ideation process. And uh, it means that we need to prepare ourselves to go through an ideation process. And uh, uh, our brains have two sides that think completely different. One is artistic and abstract, the other one is all based in fact, and it's pretty much the one that we use every day. So uh, if you think that somebody will come up with a really cool, innovative idea after he or she has been in the office working all day long, and you're gonna ask them to ideate in the afternoon at any point of time, I'll say, uh, it is very unlikely, it could happen, but it's very unlikely. However, if you put this ideation process or meeting very early on in the day, first thing in the morning, they have their brain clear of all these emails and, and, and problems that they may actually have. This is why companies nowadays have what they call the war room or, 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 or they do their um, um, meetings away from the office to try to detach people from the normal daily work of life which uses your side of the brain, which is all based in facts, all basic, it's all analytical and no creative. When you prepare people, it starts with when are we meeting, where, where are we meeting, and what are we doing right before uh, ideation? So I'm gonna talk about uh, in, that in, in two seconds. So uh, again, we bound the problem, we talk about this, we make sure that, that uh, narrow enough, farming the brain. So uh, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, uh, people have bring pianos in, have bring music instruments so that people start playing on this. Uh, I have seen, I have actually been in meetings where when I get in the meeting, there's a jazz music being played uh, and, and start changing the mood of everybody that is coming into the meeting. Uh, or they have uh, 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 pieces of paper and, and colors so that people naturally grab it and start drawing. Uh, and what all that is doing is moving your brain from being analytical to actually being more creative. And uh, so there is a, a, I was exposed to one example that it was the one that I'm giving you. Two minutes try to identify, give, they didn't give me a number, uh, at least 30 different things that you can do with a pencil. And uh, and I would like you to actually do it uh, uh, and, uh, in the next two minutes. Tell me how many things can you do with a pencil? And, uh, and in 15 minutes when we complete, I would like to hear who had the most to see how many. Okay, so two minutes going now.
One minute. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Okay. So um, you hear me saying one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds. Uh, all this was done on purpose to put pressure and, and making you think as a time box that makes you focus and makes you produce. And, uh, and uh, uh, it's, again, it's a, it's a way that, that, uh, that uh, facilitators uh, use to, to enhance uh, production of ideas. So in brainstorming, uh, after you have a warm brain and your brain is now in this creative mode, start with a question. Uh, how might we uh, move from point A to point B without using horses, uh, for example? Um, we focus in brainstorming to generate ideas, as many as we can. And uh, usually facilitators will tell you, the team that gets 100 ideas will get a prize. And everybody just go nuts and start putting ideas. They use post-it notes and use it and put, put it on, 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 um, on the walls or on the, on the desk. And they go as fast as they can. Um, also, in brainstorming, we, we cannot judge ideas as we are producing them. We let judgment for later uh, so that people feel free just to go nuts. And within the boundaries that we set up in the question, then we'll go and and try to produce. But to keep people on, on focus, these are usually small groups, um, uh, seven plus minus two. Um, we generate ideas by writing uh, what the idea is, sometimes by actually drawing the idea itself. Uh, these are techniques that, that people have used to generate wild ideas. Uh, if you can uh, Google Shiritori in, um, in a TED talk, you'll, you'll see a Japanese gentleman that his job was actually to come up with innovative toys. And uh, he got super stressed and his right brain was, uh, his uh, analytical brain was working more than his creative brain and found himself that he was gonna be fired. So he went and look at this actually um, Shiritori uh, game that is played by uh, giving you the first letter of a word and then you need to uh, come up with a word for that. And then he used that to actually come up with new toys in, in, a, in a very innovative way. Anyways, so moving forward, have a time box. You're going to do time generation in 10 minutes and come up with as many ideas as you can. Um, at a minimum number of ideas. Try to learn from somebody else's ideas as they are actually bringing them up. And, um, uh, and provide as many means for people to come up with ideas, have a leader that is not necessarily a leader, a, um, uh, a leader for the moment for, the, for this particular task. And um, the most important thing that I want you to remember about uh, ideation is uh, how the facilitator or the leader can actually play with people's mind as you're going through this. I remember that when I was doing mine, my uh, facilitator was saying, okay, what about if you are Bill Gates and you have all the millions of dollars of this world? And what about if you are Superman and you can do all this thing? And he was actually playing with the constraints of the brains of everybody. Then of course, uh, you, you have brainstorming, you go through the process, collect all these ideas, and then start looking at the ideas, group them, uh, the team will come and see which one have the same theme. And, uh, and then start to down select into groups of what is actually the, are the most uh, uh, promising ideas. And uh, so that you move it into the next phase of design thinking. Um, very important, super important in 
the idea generation, to give people individual reflection time. The past and actually the original design thinking process push people to have just a single uh, step or phase for ideation. And act, this is actually not well, and it's actually uh, supported by companies like Google, in which uh, people have found that they leave the, the brainstorming session and go back home. And next day, they come back and revisit. And during that period of time, the brain of everybody is working on the ideas. And that's when the best and most innovative ideas come up with, when you have individual reflection time away from the team, thinking about what are those most promising ideas. So, and, uh, then of course the team will select what are those most uh, promising and move them to the selection. And uh, the selection, the ideas uh, have three or uh, four major criteria. How desirable the idea it is for the end user how feasible it is for the organization or for us, how financially viable the idea is and how original the idea is. And uh, the first three are part of the common uh, design thinking framework put by IDEO. The last one I actually added in Adobe University by doing all the, the research and, and observation that we're doing in, in entrepreneurship. And this last one to me is so important that should be always the first one. There is not actually a flow here because it means that you may actually have come up with an idea that somebody else have already developed. And you may decide to go into this design thinking process to later down find out after you prototype that somebody else did it. You never did that check that what has been done before. So, but anyways, so in desirability, as I said, we like to target the emotions. So there is research done, and I put the, the paper down and as a reference on how many emotions a particular product, service, or solution process can generate. And I'll say, take a look at these uh, emotions and think about what, how many of them your iPhone or your Samsung smartphone produced to you. And you'll see how actually attached you are to that particular service. Your goal is to come up with an idea that generate as many of these uh, emotions in your end users so that they like you and they want to buy you and they want to keep you, give you money or using your idea to, for the best of the organization or society. So again, ask yourself how many these uh, positive emotions you actually uh, produce. With respect to feasibility, is your idea super nuts? Or is it an aha uh -huh, or is it a da? So uh, how possible it actually is for the organization and for you? If it is not and it's an, in another galaxy, bring it down to be an aha. Uh -huh. If it is so uh, normal or common as a da, bring it up to being an aha. Uh -huh. So it's just an example. Of, actually, this was a part of uh, my uh, uh, design thinking uh, workshop. Uh, we wanted to enhance global education, which is super good right now with the, the pandemia. Uh, somebody say, let's teletransport to the classroom. <laughs> so uh, we are not there yet, right? It's nonsense. Uh, somebody else said, oh, let's use video conferencing. Yeah, right. I've been using video conferencing for more than almost close to 10 years already. So what about if we find some point in between and using uh, the Oculus, the HoloLens, which virtual reality to enhance our classroom education. Then you get an aha of a nice solution for a problem that is not crazy in terms of, of capabilities, right? So, of course, I was asked, asked you to do it. And think about when you produce an idea, is a roadmap. It goes on phases, which we have a vision, we have our iterations, and little by little, we build a solution. We see what happened with the iPhone, went through set of iterations with every uh, new release that helps enhance the camera and, and the power and the, and the battery uh, uh, duration and all that. So there is a nice 
template that I'm providing to you that you can use. So go and have a, for your system a, a roadmap uh, that's going to help also also to assess maybe how much is going to uh, uh, how much funding you will need to produce or just only the first iteration with because to the viability how much money do you need do you really know you have a, a, a system a roadmap will help you to actually focus on iterations as I said before we spend three months just in understanding trying to understand our problem who funds that so uh, uh, and there are many different of ways that you can actually find money for your ideas, um, your network, your family, your partner, angel investors. Here in ODU, uh, you may actually get some little funding for so, so for your projects or do crowdfunding. Uh, uh, to, uh, and always remember that you only will risk what you will be willing to lose. You'll put 10 hours a week in this initiative for one month and let's see where it goes. You put a thousand dollars in this initiative, and let's see how it goes. After a thousand dollars, you're out. Next one is coming. That is a real systematic investor, and, um, and this is kind of what you see in terms of how much money you actually get from uh, venture capitalists. Is usually uh, four millions up. Uh, founders is from zero to two hundred and fifty k's. Angel investor two hundred and fifty to one point five million, and there is a gap that they are trying to actually. The final part of, of your idea is check if somebody else has done it. How do you do that? Go and Google it. Go to Amazon. Uh, go into Google Scholar, where the, the academics are writing their papers. Uh, or go into Google Patents and the US Patent uh, uh, Technology Office to see if somebody have actually put a um, patent on that. Go into crowdfunding to see if somebody is already funding this. Uh, and if not, then file for a provisional patent. It just costs $100 and protects your idea. So um, finally, it's prototyping, right? So it's important, and we're running out of time. Uh, it's important that we do uh, something quickly to try to learn if it is a good idea or not. So what is this actually became surgical tool, the idea. So using what you have around you, uh, actually, move those ideas into practice as much as you can. And I'm providing all, all of this so that you can have it. So prototyping is the best way to collect feedback from what you're actually doing. Uh, it goes from different phases to try to figure out, and I'm gonna use pictures. These are rough prototype that little by little can a final product rest your legs when you are at work. And, uh, so it's nothing similar to what we have in the beginning, right? That's the idea. Little by little change it. Here's another example. And uh, uh, the cool thing is that nowadays we have many different ways of doing Virtual reality helps to do that. There are apps that helps you, uh, uh, websites that help you develop an app before you actually do it. Uh, or storyboards to actually come up with new processes. 3D printing is a good way of doing it too. And hackathons where people just jump to try to uh, come up with solutions to problems. Maker spaces like the one that we have in, in, uh, here in ODU that give you the tools and teach you how to use the tools to actually use it. Finally, is your validation. So is your customer happy with it? How do we know that? So put the product out and see if actually do, it does what actually everybody's expecting. And tweak it if not, ask the customers what happened is it, it's really fitting, fitting your uh, uh, needs. There are different ways in which these are actually done, A-B testing, cohort analysis, fund and analysis, on actually robust experimentation. Uh, uh, outsourcing is actually a good way. It's done online and it helps you collect quick feedback. But the bad thing is that you're putting your idea out, but that's a trade-off, right? And, um, experimentation is expensive and consuming and uh, in the end, it's, it's a good way for um, uh, very complex products. Finally, my last slide is failing. Don't be afraid of failing. If you are going to become an innovator, an entrepreneur, uh, or an intrapreneur, uh, failing is actually part of your game. It's actually meaning the first attempt, attempt in learning. If you fail, never give up. And the opposite is, 
You only fail and you give up. Uh, failing is just part of the process. Just remember baseball. When you become an entrepreneur or an innovator, it's like you becoming a baseball player. If you hit the ball five out of 10 times in your career, you are a legend. You are expected to fail. And uh, innovation and entrepreneurship are not exact sciences. Uh, fail smart, learn fast, fail systematically so you know what actually went wrong and, uh, and in a very reduced scope so that you don't risk too much time and too much money and too much of your image. Uh, and seek support. So there are companies out there, people out there that are, are just willing to give you all the support they have in, in this innovation and entrepreneurial uh, a journey. So we are, although you have the entrepreneurial uh, center that provides help to women, government, and students and alumni uh, on how to become uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. But with that being said, I am like three minutes short and I don't know how much time we have for, for a question, but uh, Orlando. Great presentation, my friend. As usual, you're you're so good at giving this type of presentation. And I wasn't, I was never, I've never been in one of these topics. I I have heard you a lot talking about this, but I've never in a in a formal way like today. I really enjoyed it, the presentation. Um, I'm gonna ask one question, and with that, I'm gonna wrap. We're gonna wrap up because we have no more no more questions. I I remember I, we don't have time for many questions, and and what I wanna do is to. I'm gonna look into the chat and any question I have, I'll send it to you by email and we can share them with the participants. Okay. Um, I remember Steve Jobs saying, uh, I might be mistaken, but something like that his job was to find the needs that people didn't know they needed. Then, uh, so how, how do you do that? Because it that's another level of, looking at the needs and 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 as you said uh, if you wanna if you're gonna work on a project create a problem uh, you have if you want to define what the problem you're gonna know it the needs mm -hmm. but in in at that level of steep jobs level of finding the need that the public doesn't even know they have how do you do that uh, uh, i read about that and uh people were saying that that uh, criticizing them uh criticizing him that he was not necessarily that guru that can read people's mind, that he actually had a mechanism to get in there. And the mechanism was the uh, Apple stores, where uh, the people in the Apple stores actually do the interviews with, with the customer. And what happened? What didn't work? What it was here? So tell, show me what, what happened. Show me how it didn't work, how, how this uh, broke down into you. And, and they actually brought all that information back into the development process. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a lot of observation, a lot of uh, talking and trying to uh, put, uh, um, to connect the dice into, oh, maybe what they're talking is that they need more of this. Then put the product out and let's collect feedback. And then let's keep doing that. And if you see the iPhone has gone from iPhone uh, zero to 11 and in every iteration, it, uh, things that you normally didn't think it, it's actually in there. So uh, yeah, it, 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 is, it, is no, it is not easy, uh, uh, especially when you are coming up with something completely radical, but that's the only way that you get there. So let me see how, uh, how, how they, they develop the, the mouse. I mean, uh, it's amazing. Uh, and even Google, I mean, you see this thing happening all the time. It's, it's, when you type a question, uh, it just tells you all the words that is, are coming up and that are, are potential. How do we get there? It's a lot of analytics and a lot of front, front end analysis. But again, you can have the best power uh, for analytics if you are not able to come up with understanding out of the analytics. It can lead you many different uh, uh, directions. I know. I guess, I guess that's the reason the Apple Store looked like a playground. It's inviting you to play with the, all, the, all the gadgets, all the equipment there. Yeah. Very smart. Didn't think about it, but that's very smart. Yeah, I read an article about that specifically. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, we just ran out of time. Thank you so much, Rafael. Uh, we're going to stop because there is another session going on starting right now. Um, thank you so much. Great talk.
Um, thank I'll you. see you, everybody, all the participants. Thank you for joining us. Joining Bye. us. Bye.